April 3rd, 2019 morning session of the Portland City Council. Good morning, Carla. Could you please call the roll? Yes, good morning. Fish? Here. Hardesty? Here. Udaly? Fritz? Here. Wheeler? Here. And now we'll hear from our legal counsel, Robert, on some of the rules of decorum. Good morning, Robert. Welcome to the Portland City Council. The City Council represents all Portlanders and meets to do the city's business. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during City Council meetings so everyone can feel welcome, comfortable, respected, and safe. To participate in council meetings, you may sign up in advance with the council clerk's office for communications to briefly speak about any subject. You may also sign up for public testimony on resolutions or the first readings of ordinances. Your testimony should address the matter being considered at the time. If it does not, you may be ruled out of order. When testifying, please state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Please disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify it. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. When you have 30 seconds left, a yellow light goes on. When your time is done, a red light goes on. If you are in the audience and would like to show your support for something that is said, please feel free to do a thumbs up. If you want to express that you do not support something, please feel free to do a thumbs down. Please remain seated in council chambers unless entering or exiting. If you are filming the proceedings, please do not use bright lights or disrupt the meeting. Disruptive conduct, such as shouting or interrupting testimony or council deliberations, will not be allowed. If there are disruptions, a warning will be given that further disruption may result in the person being ejected for the remainder of the meeting. After being ejected, a person who fails to leave the meeting is subject to arrest for trespass. Thank you for helping your fellow Portlanders feel welcome, comfortable, respected, and safe. Thank you very much. First up is communications. Carla, could you call the first individual? Item 274, request of Lewis Doctor to address council regarding proposal for a tiered commercial tax rate for vacant and blighted downtown property. He is not able to make it. And that was noticed on the Tuesday memo as well as my understanding. Next individual, please. 275, request of Brad Perkins to address council regarding Rose Quarter, Trailblazers, I-5 widening project, and new bridge over Columbia River near BNSF Railway Bridge. Welcome back, Mr. Perkins. Can I do all that in three minutes? <laughs> Good morning, council. Um, I'm Brad Perkins. I represent uh, uh, Cascadia High Speed Rail and Soul District Business Association. Mayor Ted Wheeler. I read a quote by you in the March 14th, uh, 2019 uh, Portland Trib newspaper regarding Old Dot's I-5 Rose Quarter Improvement Project. You stated that it is a once in a lifetime opportunity to reconnect the Albina community. Instead, this disaster project will do the opposite. This misunderstanding started when the city council supported this project prematurely without Old Dot completing an environmental assessment. Portland Public Schools and 90% of those who testified at the only EA hearing demanded a more thorough EIS study. The Portland City Council did not give the future of the Rose Quarter to ODOT. The surrounding area to, is the center of the African American community. It's Portland's east bank of the Willamette River with beautiful views of downtown. As our transportation hub and center for events, it begs carefully planned redevelopment. In the 1950s and 60s, fossil fuel vehicle demand pushed leaders to bulldoze historic urban centers and uh, neighborhoods for freeway development. The I-5 scar through North Portland's Rose Quarter has drastically torn the urban fabric of the area and will not miraculously come together by spending 500 million on a freeway widening topped with vacant space and shrubs. It is absolutely necessary to take a more intelligent climate change planning approach for the heart of central east side Portland. The Albina Vision Group is not sanctioned by any jurisdiction nor does it represent all pertinent groups. The City Council needs to appoint a broader group of stakeholders to complete a refinement plan of the area encompassing MLK Junior Boulevard to the Willamette River and I-84 to Russell Street. Prosper Portland should authorize a request for proposals to groups for ideas to develop the area to include Cascadia High Speed Rail Station as a catalyst. 
Spending $450 million for a high, new hybrid bridge for trains and vehicles over the Columbia River west of the BNSF bridge can be matched by Washington's recently announced bridge commitment. I am currently seeking support from Oregon legislators for this more popular congestion and CO2 relieving project. The state of Washington is studying ultra-high speed rail and planning on putting together a bi-state group to guide HSR development. A new Cascadia High Speed Rail Corridor and Columbia River Bridge coupled with the, a new Rose Corridor Transportation Hub Town Center is a practical climate change alternative worthy of your attention and priority. Supporting ODOT's uh, I-5 multiple bridge bulldozing plan will worsen the divisions in our ra racially mixed environment and perpetuate the rich capitalist oil based dominance of our society and destruction of our fragile eagle system. Thank you for your time and remember the future is now. It's really up to you guys, especially with the governor announcing today that we may have to suffer through another fight with the CRC. Okay. This Thank is you, a Mr. legitimate Perkins. alternative and this is really pertinent to the city Thank council you. because it involves our streets Got it. and Thank our you. neighborhood. And thank you also for providing the written testimony. Yeah, and appreciate thank you very that. much for your You bet. Thank okay. you, sir. Next individual. Item 276, request of Aleni Kahiharis to address council regarding safety and security. Uh, did you want to come with 277 also? Okay. Uh, Tina. Okay, do you want me to call her too? Okay. Good morning. Hey, good morning, Mayor Wheeler, Commissioners Fish, U Daly, Hardesty, and Fritz. Uh, my name is Eleni Kahiaris, and I'm representing the Stadium District Business Association. I am the owner of a community-based neighborhood media company with my offices located in the Stadium District near Providence Park, home of the Timbers, in Southwest Portland. I'm also the Vice President of the Stadium District Business Association and our board representative of Venture Portland. During budget season, I would like to thank City Council for investing in the success of neighborhood business districts like ours and through the continuous funding of Venture Portland. And to Commissioner Fish, it is great to have you as a resident in our district. Uh, TriMet proposes to close four MAC stations downtown to save up to two minutes of travel time. One of the stations TriMet wants to close is the Kings Hill Station. The MAC station sits across from Lincoln High School and the Multnomah Athletic Club in the heart of the stadium district. The Goose Hollow community has been advocating to keep the station open given the safety and security concerns to the neighborhood. Students, MAC members, guests, and employees in our district rely on this station along with Goose Hollow residents. With the platform located in the median, it is the safest station in the area with good lighting and sight lines. As the chair of the Lincoln Long-Term Development Committee, co-chair of the Master Planning Committee, and a member of the Design Advisory Group, I have spent many years involved in the plan for new construction on the Lincoln site. The new front doors will sit at 17th and Salmon. The shortest distance to a max stop would be Kings Hill. Due to budget constraints and city design requirements, the site will suffer at least 20% decrease, if not more, for a loss in parking. Children and staff occupy the campus from 5 a.m. to 11 p.m., and the need for safe access to transit options will only increase. We are experiencing extensive development in our district, which will bring many improvements over the next few years. We feel the decision to close the stop is uh, a little bit premature, and pending the outcome of those uh, changes would be beneficial. As a daily TriMet user myself, I value the need for making improvements on travel time. However, we feel the decision to close the stop and reduce transit time by a few seconds for those passing through the city is not taking the best care and consideration for the area users who would have more travel time and safety concerns added to their commute to school or work by eliminating the access point at Kings Hill. TriMet has increased its period for community input and therefore we seek your advocacy and support I urge you to stand on the side of the area users who value the safety and accessibility of the Kings Hill stop and implore TriMet to delay the decision to close the stop until more development and residents move into the district. Those developments will bring improved lighting, sight lines, and increased pedestrian density, making it safer to walk the distance to the other stations. Thank you for your time and consideration. Good day. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank Commissioner you. Hardesty. Could I ask the question? 
Yes. Uh, when is TriMet supposed to make this decision? Um, I'm not sure how much time they have left on that. They did extend it a little bit. It was something that was supposed to be decided months ago, so they have opened it up to more. There was just a community input last week. Thank you so much. Thank if you'd you. be kind enough to leave some material at my office, I absolutely agree with you. I think it's stupid to be closing a stop that's right at a high school. It doesn't make sense. Thank you, especially with the new door, uh, front door being there. And I did leave you guys written testimony as well as um, our stadium district maps. Thank you so Thank much. You. Commissioner E. Daly. Commissioner Fritz. Thank you for testifying today. Um, I have not found that TriMet has been very interested in what the council has to say or what I have to say as a commissioner. So I'm glad that you have um, put this in front of the public on um, Open Signals Cable Access Television. Thank you. How, so it really is going to be up to community members to talk to TriMet to try to get them to uh, change the decision. Mm -hmm. If somebody watching today wants to join you in this um, advocacy, how would they get? In, how would they reach TriMet? Or, or get in touch with you? Um, their email is hello at trimet.org. Dot dot org. Thank you. So people should just send comments there? Yes, they can send comments to that um, email address. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. Next individual, please, Carla. Item 277, request of Tina Wysinski to address council regarding safety and security. Good morning. Thank you very much, Commissioners, Mayor Wheeler, Mr. Fish for living, Commissioner Fish for living in our district. Um, my name is Tina Wisinski. I'm with the Stadium District Business Association. I'm actually the founder and president. Um, I want to thank you all very much for letting us um, come and speak today. Um, we are members of Venture Portland. Eleni is my vice president. Um, the subject I want to talk about today is not a pretty one. Um, it's about the homeless camping. It's against the law, yet it is still happening throughout the city. My work, that's not my volunteer work, takes me to all four quadrants of the city and to some sub suburb, suburban areas as well. And um, the problem is everywhere. It's not just in the stadium district. While it's against the law, it doesn't feel like much is being done to enforce the law. And while camping is a huge problem, the collateral damage, such as litter, fire, and everything that goes along with it is another. This is not a unique problem, as I've said, to our district, but it is a problem for all local area businesses. In the stadium district, you know we have a lovely new expansion project going on at the stadium, um, soon to be completed. People will be coming here from all over the country and really the world this summer to visit the stadium and to visit our city. Unfortunately, all roads into our beautiful city are laden with trash, garbage, and many other things I don't want to say on morning television. Our city has become a landfill. In our district, we have regular cleanups. I see camps being cl cleaned up one day, only to return in a matter of days, sometimes hours. As a district, we would like to help you help us clean up our city, and we'd love to know what else we can do. I would also like to commend Lucas Hillier of the city, who um, took my phone call and returned it after a very long message, because I can't be chatty. And he actually got, um, got he had a very nice explanation, which I don't think the rest of us get to hear very often. Um, he also did mention that he's a staff of one, or he's one person managing a staff of two people. My ask would be that some more dollars are, are, don't, are found, I don't know how we do it, and again, we will try to, to do something to help you, but to help clean up the city and to provide other resources so that camping isn't an acceptable thing in Portland anymore. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate it. And uh, I, I don't know if you're aware of it, but just in a few minutes, we're gonna hear from the auditor on her audit of the Camp Sign Cleanup Program. I read it's, it yesterday. Oh, yeah. very good. <laughs> I, I just wanted you to be aware of that in case. I will stay for it. Commissioner Fritz. And there are um, other districts who are um, doing as you are doing and, and getting together to look at holistically about this. We just approved a district on the central east side that looks at maybe different approaches to helping people who are living outside and making sure that the entire area is livable for everybody. So um, we hope that you'll continue to engage with the city. And thank you for commending Lucas Hillier. I agree he does amazing work. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, I, I agree with what Commissioner Fritz just said. Um, people aren't on the street because they want to be. People are on the street because this is a city that's unaffordable for most working people. 
Um, and we need partnerships rather than division. And so I look forward to working cooperatively to figure out how we allow people to live with dignity until we have housing that people can afford to live in. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Next individual, please. Item 278, request of Michael Zhang to address council regarding progress of work being done with the community law division. I don't see Mr. Zhang here. Carla, have any items been pulled off the consent agenda? Yes, we have two items, item 283 and 284. All right, those will be taken up at the end of the regular agenda. Let's go to the first time certain item, please, item 279. Roll, roll call. Uh, yuck, thank you very much. Uh, please call the roll on the remainder of the consent agenda, Carla. Fish? Aye. Hardesty? Aye. Udaley? Aye. Fritz? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. Consent agenda is adopted. Item 279, please. Accept Travel Portland 2018 Annual Report. Colleagues, today we're going to hear from Travel Portland on their great work creating economic impact in the Portland uh, in Portland businesses, both large and small. This year, they're going to celebrate 40 years as a nonprofit organization. It's partner-driven business engaging stakeholders to help shape a Portland that residents love and keeps visitors coming back year after year. Tourism is a very important part of our economy. It means over $5 billion of spending in the region, supporting over 36,000 jobs. A couple of areas I'm glad to see focused on are cultural diversity and community engagement, vulnerable communities, neighborhood business districts, and the James Beard Public Market that we've had the opportunity to hear about over the years. I also want to thank Travel Portland for joining Portland Means Progress as an early adopter, connecting young people to the booming hospitality industry and those jobs I think will be critical to our success in the years ahead. I want to welcome Jeff Miller, who's the president of Travel Portland, and Martin Martinez from Orox Leather. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here today. Mayor Rio, Council, it's so nice to be here talking about our program of work. Uh, we've got lots of good information. Uh, you may know that we moved from a destination marketing organization to a destination marketing and management organization, and that change really balances storytelling with stewardship. What makes Portland a great place to live is what makes Portland a great place to visit. And so we believe that uh, a great place to live is the first thing that we need to think about. And, and our dual role as destination marketers and stewards, we are at the table on issues around livability, diversity, inclusion, equity, and more. And one thing that we do know, though, is Portlanders like tourism. We do a biannual survey with more information, and 57% of the residents said that tourism improves the quality of overall quality of life. 87% said that tourists have a positive impact on our local economy, economy meaning jobs, businesses, support, and the tax base. Um, the, what you see on the screen, these interactive statues are called the Portlanders. We took them on the road this year in 2018. Uh, to San Francisco, Los Angeles, Scenic, uh, Seattle, Phoenix, and Minneapolis. And they tell the story of beer, food, tax-free shopping, hiking, and of course, naked bike riding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, these statues are, are actually uh, interactive with virtual reality headsets, and you look through the eyes of Portlanders uh, through these. Uh, the statues share really what Portlanders love about Portland, and we know it's the people here that make this place a great place to visit. I'm also joined at the table by a real-life Portlander whose business is supported also by tourism, and he'll talk to you in just a few minutes. Our mission is to generate travel demand that drives economic impact for Portland. It's pretty simple, and it keeps us very focused on what we need to do. I'll run through some quick numbers. This is from Dean Runyon Research for the three-county region. 8.7 million overnight trips, which increased 1% this last year. The spending that Mayor Wheeler spoke of, 5.3 billion, but you can see the amount that it's grown since 2010, almost a 50% increase. Travel-related employment, 36,360 jobs, and we know that that will continue to, to climb as more hotels are opening. The very many have already opened their doors, and we have several to go. 
And we also often get a rap that these are low paying jobs. We do have a lot of entry level jobs, but they also provide career path to higher uh, career goals. <clears throat> And we are very proud to be an early adopter of Portland Means Progress. We will actively work to connect those youth to jobs in our industry. The transient lodging tax has continued to increase. This represents 1% of the tax, and of course the city gets 5%, um, which will be about $41 million this year. And you can see the growth over time, and we really do feel the need to make sure that that tax is growing for all Portlanders to benefit from. Probably the best thing that has happened to our business is the addition of the Hyatt Regency Portland at the Oregon Convention Center, which is scheduled to open in early 2020. It needs to be open by March because our first citywide convention is moving in. <laughs> so we're, we're excited about that. You can see 2019, we booked 195,000 room nights just in convention business, but over 347,000 room nights when you add the meetings business, uh, the single hotel business as well. And then you see also that incredible economic impact that, that comes along with that. We also plan to double what we did last year. And I'll talk about one conference in particular that we're getting ready to book. It's the National Convention of the Government Finance Officers Association in May of 2023 with 14,000 room nights and an economic impact of $9.5 million. We have tried for years to get this conference and now, now with the Hyatt in our package, we were able to book it. And thanks to Jennifer Cooperman, uh, the city CFO, she was very helpful with us and our team in, in making sure that we're going to get that. You will see a VDF grant soon for that, Commissioners Fritz and Mayor Wheeler. <laughs> um, also, as the hotel rooms have grown, we know short-term rentals have grown. In 2014, there were about 1,500. As of August 2017 at the eclipse, there were 4,600. Airbnb has remitted their lodging taxes, and through partnership with you on the council, they are now remitting also their tourism improvement district fees, which has allowed us to, to expand programs to help businesses uh, do a better job. Uh, with that legislation, we added Eric Brion, who's the CEO of Vacasa, to our board, and Shannon Hillier Webb, who's an Airbnb super host. And Commissioner Fritz rightly suggested that we add a super host, and she's a terrific addition, so thank you for that. We were excited to have her, her come on. And now I'd like to introduce Martine Martinez, who, uh, whose business certainly benefits from tourism, but who has been an amazing partner of ours as we travel both domestically and internationally, and talking about the maker community here. And again, it's all about the people when, when we talk about Portland. And Martin will talk a little bit about a program called Local, which I'll dig into a little bit more, but I want him to uh, tell you sort of what he has to say about tourism. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, hi, I'm Martin Martinez, uh, co-founder and general manager at Oroch's Leather Co. with our office and workshop located in uh, 450 Northwest Coach. Oroch's Leather is a small family business that makes and sells quality handcrafted leather goods. Our products include wallets, purses, belts, bags, and other accessories. These products fit well with the lifestyles of Portland residents and visitors, which is an important reason why we are in this city. We opened our combination workshop and retail store in Northern Chinatown on December 2012, and we currently have 10 employees working for us. Travel Portland has been a significant partner for us over the past several years. We estimate that 50 to 65% of our customers uh, are from our, across the, the U.S. and across the globe. Travel Portland has provided excellent support for us in a number of ways. Uh, one example is the Make or Trifles brochures available for visitors at the convention center, which is a great location for or to show our business. We list our business uh, in, their, in their directory, which visitors access when they are making travel plans. Every week, we track website visits which were referred from Travel Portland website. Oryx Leather was featured in several articles and a gift guide written by Travel Portland and posted their website and sent out to various media in press releases. Travel Portland, in combination with Prosper Portland, enabled us to exhibit and sell our products at my people's market, and where businesses of color are connected with travel industry and new market opportunities. We are looking forward to the, to the third year of this event at the end of the month, where we will join over 80 other businesses like ours with over 1,000 expected attendees. Oroch Leather has been engaged with new a new program partner called Local, who is working with 
us to increase our customer traffic. They show us techniques for bringing more prospective customers to us through Google Maps, Google Map searches. One of my favorite stories about, about it was about someone who was walking past our shop and they receive a, a phone notification telling them about a, an offering. And uh, they turn around and they came by to our store. They, they saw our products and met a family and they, they end up with a story. They left with a, with, with a, when a, as a one of our products. Local taught us about this marketing practice plus several others which has resulted in more traffic and more conversions on those visits. Local has also made other changes for us of which we do not have direct access, but which help us bring more traffic and more sales. Overall, we see more visitors and sales as a result of locals, locals work for us. Throughout Portland included, in, included us in an event in New York City to meet with a large number of local media to promote Portland as, a, as an outstanding travel destination. This, is, this event provided our brand with an excellent exposure to various media whom we had no, prior contact, had no prior contact, and an area of network with the other iconic Portland brands. Oryx Leather has been uh, featured on two national television shows, Naturally Danny Seo and Handcrafted America. And we expect to be in another on public broadcasting this summer. We have also been featured in several magazines, um, articles over the past several years. We believe that Travel Portland may have helped to steer these organizations to consider our business for their coverage. In summer, uh, in, in summary, Travel Portland has played an important, effective role in, their, in the success of our business. More than half of our customers come from outside Portland, and Portland area, and Travel Portland has proven to be a valuable resource for our success. As a self-funded small business, we are grateful to have partners like Travel Portland on our side, and we rely on their efforts for long-term health of our business. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for, thank you, Travel Porta. Thank, thank you, Martin. Martin. Appreciate it. Thanks Appreciate for being it. here. Yeah. So I'll dig into a little bit of our work now. Um, one thing that you, I know you know about is My People's Market. We held a third one on November 9th of 2018 at the Custom House Blocks, and it's a partnership with Prosper Portland that we're very excited about. Um, my interest, especially in My People's Market, is really the B2B connections and for hospitality businesses to be able to connect with local businesses. And you know, if these are all, of course, the, the Mercatus vendors. And I want to give a huge shout out to uh, the Mercatus website. It has allowed our convention services managers who are working with those national meeting planners to connect them with local businesses, services that they need. And that website has been a boon for us to be able to get directly to those businesses. So uh, I just saw Kimberly Branham uh, in the building and really thanked her again. And we have a surprise for them with Mercatus later. Uh, My People's Market 4.0 will be May 31st and June 1st at the Broadway Corridor. The first day will be exclusively dedicated to business-to-business -to -business opportunities for those vendors. Again, something very important to me. And we're holding it while we have a convention in town called NCOR, the National Conference on Race and Ethnicity in Higher Education. And we've had a, a big push to bring more ethnically diverse conventions to Portland, and this is a terrific one. It has 3,000 attendees, and that first entire day will allow those delegates to interact with our local businesses in the My People's Market atmosphere. The second day will be certainly the marketplace and a cultural celebration, but that B2B piece is, it will, we hope to really expand their businesses beyond Portland's borders. Uh, we've really increased our emphasis on research. One, what are people thinking about Portland? We're doing a nationwide perception survey quarterly. As you know, Portland gets good press and sometimes bad press. Two, to understand what people are saying about Portland, social listening and monitoring. And three, to, uh, to really understand how on the ground visitors are experiencing Portland. And we've partnered with Oregon State to conduct intercept surveys around town. And you can see from this chart that people are delighted to recommend Portland to their friends and family to come. Our consumer marketing campaign, which is mostly focused on the winter months when businesses need more help, uh, we use the data that, that we've been talking about to shape that creative work. And you'll see it's called You Can in Portland. We think it talks about this place as a place of opportunity, uh, a place that's friendly and welcoming, and it's a multi-channel, uh, multi-tiered campaign uh, that we do around the country. And I'm going to show you the stop motion uh, advertisement that we had and make sure that you watch the chicken.
floats your boat, or tickles your taste buds, or brightens your day. Even if you've never tried it before. Just know that you can in Portland. <laughs> We've gotten terrific comments on, on that, and it was fun to have that produced actually here in Portland. Uh, the other thing that we know is content is king. And we have forged some really strategic partnership with digital publishers like Chef's Feed and Vice. And it's Portlanders telling their story. Again, you see Gregory Gourdet there and his interaction with other chefs uh, went out on their digital platform. But we're also excited about our newest content partnership with o Open Signal, a community-driven media arts center. Open Signal has created an incubator program that supports black filmmakers and the creation of new work. And T Travel Portland has stepped up as a partner there. We'll leverage that content via this program, which connects young African-American filmmakers with established African-Americans in the film industry to new create new content. And that allows us to push it out on digital platforms and, again, give a voice to real Portlanders and their stories. The You Can campaign was uh, won the best branding and integrated marketing campaign in 2018 by the uh, US Travel Association. But even more importantly, Focus Right, our research firm, said that we drove $156 million of incremental business in those winter months. Cash registers ringing is what we are all about. Commissioner Excuse Hardesty. me. Uh, when you use the term incremental spending, what does that mean exactly? It would not have happened but for the, the, the campaign. Ah, uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. And I have challenged the Travel Portland team to be the most innovative destination marketing and management organization in the country. You've seen some of these things. We're holding a marketing conference today with a record attendance of 220 people, really helping businesses learn more about marketing and how to, how to push their businesses out there. But we know that our job isn't finished when visitors arrive, that we need to attack, uh, attach them to those businesses with their dollars. And I'd like to share one of the ways that we're doing that. There are three universal truths about today's travelers. One, they use their phones to search. They almost exclusively use Google and Google Maps. And after performing the search, they intend to visit that business in the near future. The other truth that we know is that <clears throat> Portland businesses, like all businesses, are stretched thin. So they're missing easy opportunities in this digital space. 20% of Travel Portland's partners are not Business, do not have their uh, business verified on Google. And of those 20%, most aren't optimized. So our pilot project is with a company called Local. And it's, we want to be the first city that's Google Map optimized, it, which increases the online uh, visibility, overall profitability of businesses, provides visitors and locals with better on the ground experience, and shapes visitor perceptions. Local is a local company is actually a local Portland company and that are focused on Google My Business and Google Maps listing, which is how we all search. Um, Travel Portland is able to do this for all visitors facing, facing businesses free the first year, which is an $1,800 value to each of these businesses because we believe it's so important to make sure that, that we, we uh, help them attract more business. The business will get a, a dashboard. This is Bamboo Sushi. Uh, and it really gives the business more analytics on their Google searches and the business they are getting and helps them, and local will help them analyze and make better business decisions. As a destination, and what we're mostly interested in, Travel Portland gets a, a dashboard and really gives us business type, what's happening in business type when we have an event in town, and we can really track what's going on. So it's, it's exciting for us. As a case study, Wild Fang um, signed up uh, along with Tinder Loving Empire, OMSI, Mark Spencer Hotel, Groundworks, the Portland Japanese Garden, Orox, and a few others to be the guinea pigs. Wild Fang in January saw a 79% increase in direction requests and a 321 increase in direct searches just from signing, optimizing their Google listings. These are some of the testimonials of those businesses. We've had about 200 sign up, and we're signing up more today at the marketing conference. One of our next pushes will be for landmarks and for Portland parks. And so we'll, we'll work with the Parks Bureau, but we'll raise the profile for city parks in those Google searches, ensure that they're accurately represented, and make sure that they are part of the tourism package. And we'll, they'll, we'll measure, measure their visitation in new ways.
and we are also happy to be a sponsor of Summer Free For All uh, in Portland Parks. And I'll conclude by saying that the visitor industry in Travel Portland is very excited about our partnership with the city and actions like adding the short-term rentals to the Tourism Improvement District has allowed us to do programs like local and my people's markets and to really grow our influence in making business, having businesses create more business for themselves. Thank you. Happy to take any questions if you have them. Commissioner Fish. Jeff, excellent presentation as always. Um, um, you said that we have about 8.7 million overnight trips. And that's, is that in the region or is that just? The three county region, yes. Three county region. Um, I seem to recall from last year though, we, you said that we had a total of about 16 million tourists who come into the region every year. Is that, is that number still, still correct? It's, it's, a, it's hard to tell the number of tourists versus the number of overnight trips, but it's probably close to that. Um, because we get a lot of day trips. You get a lot of day trips. How are we doing with, compared to peer cities? Like, let's take Seattle, for example, which has roughly our population. Um, how do we stack up? Yeah, we stack up actually very nicely because they have so many more direct flights, uh, international flights, and they're a Delta hub. Obviously, they're a bigger city, and um, they are uh, that their international business is larger than ours. But we are growing there, and I think we stack up nicely with against them, against Minneapolis, certainly against Austin, and those are the cities that we consider. And on the international side, we have five cities that we compare ourselves to, and how they're doing internationally. And we've stacked up really well there. This year's been a little tough. Uh, but more flights are, are happening in other cities than here. And also, um, uh, we're becoming a destination city for film and TV. Mm -hmm. Hulu is doing a show currently and looks like it'll get picked up and, and other content providers are, are filming here. How does the image of Portland and film and TV help us meet our, our goals around tourism? You know, I think that, you know, we talk a lot about our access to nature here, and that's really important to TV shows because there's a real variety of places to film, both urban and uh, in, out in nature. And so that, it's really good for us. We work closely with the film office and certainly the state film office and are talking to another major TV show. Those TV shows tend to be very expensive, so uh, we don't always have the funding for that, but they are important. And finally, thank you for your sponsorship of Summer Free For All. We're, we're going to uh, be unveiling our lineup shortly, and, and uh, we've exceeded our private fundraising goal, and we're very excited to have you as part of that. So thank you very much. Well, we will be pushing all of that out on our social media to make sure that visitors also know what's going on with Summer Free For All. So the team's ready. Thank you. Commissioner Daly. Uh, well, thanks for the presentation. I um, am intrigued and just slightly creeped out by the giant figures with uh, the virtual <laughs> reality in the back of their heads. Um, uh, I wanted to ask of the 8.7 million overnight visits, do you have um, even rough numbers on how many of those individuals are staying in hotels versus short-term rentals? There's a bit of that. I don't have that information with me. Um, it really talks about overnight visitors either staying in a hotel slash Airbnb or in, with friends and family. Okay. I, I mean, I'm particularly interested in that I, issue because um, while I certainly <clears throat> support and celebrate our tourism industry, my um, first concern is how it's impacting our housing crisis. And, and that is uh, specific to short-term rentals. It's so if you concerning. have any, any numbers you can dig up, I'd appreciate that. Well, well, I'll send over the report. We are working closely with uh, Thomas Lanham and the Revenue Bureau because we agree with you that uh, illegal rentals should be gone. Uh, and certainly the host-to-host -host community believes that. And so we'll do our part. Uh, and I just spoke to Thomas a couple of days ago about things that are moving forward. So we're interested in being supportive of that as well. Thank you. Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you so much. Uh, excellent report. Um, I want to go back to something Commissioner Fish said, which is um, how is our rising houseless population impacting tourism? And what's the role of the tourism industry to help us find housing that people can afford to live in? 
You know, it, it does certainly affect people on the ground. And one of the reasons that we, we added the research that we did that I spoke of was to see what is that effect both from a social media listening and on the ground. It's certainly on the social media, both nationally and internationally, it was not as big as we, as we Portlanders may think it is. And so I was pleased to see that. I and mean, there certainly are blips around some of the protests that happen and things like that. But generally, we aren't seen as much different than any other city. You know, one of the things that we are doing on a uh, houseless situation, Tamara Kennedy Hill, who's our Vice President of Diversity and Community Relations, has convened a vulnerable communities working group. Mark Jolin is part of that, the county, the city, the mayor's office. And we are working on what is our lane as tourism to do our part to help that. So we are very engaged there. Tamara's, I think they've had two meetings now. And so we have dug into that, that issue and we're finding ways that we can help. We also support transition projects and their street outreach team, which goes around and really talks to populations and tries to move them to services. That's been very successful and those, uh, we did that along with PBA and the Business Owners and Managers Association. We're continuing to support that street outreach team. So we are at the table making sure that we have a voice and that we also are helping. Does that table include people who are experiencing houselessness? At this point, it doesn't. We're relying on the joint office to really be the guide there and, and help us find our lane. And so if they want to, if we should bring someone there, we certainly can. We want to make sure that we stay in our tourism lane because it is a big subject that a lot of people are working on. And we think we have a particular role to play as well. I hear what, you say, what, what you're saying. Um, However, I think there are way too many tables trying to address the problem of people being houseless that don't have anybody at the table who's actually experienced houselessness. And so you get better outcomes when you're actually talking to the people on the front line. So just a small suggestion about uh, who's at the table matters because the decisions you come up with have an impact on those communities. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Fritz. Um, Jeff, you also um, have been very, Travel Portland has been very supportive of dedicating $5 million of um, the tourism tax money to, I, I said they have been very supportive of um, dedicating money to permanent supportive housing for folks. And so a lot of Travel Portland's um, contribution is monetary and, and making sure that, uh, as you said, the um, organizations that do the work and engage houseless people are um, getting the support that they need through, um, yeah. as you said, everybody's staying in their lane. We're happy to be there. Thank you for your partnership. Jeff and, and Martina, I, I have a question. So uh, we've heard from you what you're working on. I've always impressed that you know, the better part of 40,000 people in this region are employed directly in the tourism industry, and obviously it's a huge component of our economy. What, what would you ask of us as the city of Portland, what do you need from us to continue to be successful and to hopefully expand tourism opportunities in the years ahead? Uh, I feel like, uh, I mean, the city really needs uh, to be constantly shining. So, I mean, like uh, anything that you can do to uh, support, you know, like uh, the um, uh, small businesses like like Orox, you know, like uh, and also the maker community, you know, like. Uh, in, ways where we can uh, thrive, you know, like uh, sometimes, I mean, like uh, the the problems that we have, you know, like uh, gonna come, uh, like uh, just having a, an area to express, you know, like, uh, or, 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 or trade, you know, like, uh, so I feel like uh, supporting Prosper Portland, Travel Portland, um, I mean, even when we started, Portland Salary Market was an area too that, that helped us be where we are at now, so. So more of that, uh, more areas for makers to express uh, their craft um, will will be uh, amazing help to m more upcoming makers in our community. So excellent, thank you. Yeah. I think this council has been very, very supportive of tourism. Remembering that tourism does create jobs and not just low-paying jobs. And when we come to you with uh, the things that we are doing. Uh, you, are, you come to our customer advisory board events and our FAM events, and we appreciate that because those, those meeting planners and delegates like knowing that our city council supports tourism and their business. 
um, and I know the Visitors Development Fund Board has been, it's always a good place to learn about the size of these businesses. So uh, you've been very supportive of us in the past and we really appreciate that and we want to give back in very specific ways that will grow jobs in the region. And I think the Portland Means Progress um, program is a, another way that you're providing resources for us to then move to that. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you, Commissioner Fish. Um, you know, uh, you mentioned um, a convention that you've landed in 2023, and it's going to bring us great prestige. I just want to acknowledge that I believe it's the American Public Garden Movement will be here in June of 2020. Yes. And um, so that will that will be happening right after next year's annual report. It's it's uh, as I tell my team at Parks. It's just around the corner. We're gonna, it's gonna happen sooner rather than later. It will bring a very important niche audience to our city, and we'll get to uh, celebrate Portland as a city of, uh, of gardens. And um, we're looking forward to showing off Leach Botanical Garden, Japanese Garden, Lansu Chinese Garden, uh, high profile gardens on the east side and the west side. And, um, and using it as a, as, a, as a way of burnishing our reputation and actually doing some fundraising locally. So another um, terrific win. Good. So thank you for that. Absolutely. Thank you, Commissioner Daly. One last question. It's probably another request for some offline information, but I'm the arts liaison now, and so it just occurred to me, you know, how vital that intersection of tourism and arts are and how arts also create a lot of jobs and uh, revenue in the city. So I'd love to have a conversation with you or if you have any existing data to share with me to think about how we can work together in that arena. And there's a, a slice of money out of the lodging excise tax called the culture for cultural tourism and a part of that we work with the regional arts and culture council and we make grants to arts organizations and other organizations to help their advertising out of town uh, because they're doing their in-town advertising and we can help fund them a bit to do that so i'll i'll make an appointment and take you through that program Great. It's, it's a pretty fun one you learn something new every day thanks good it's, it's always good to give away money commissioner hardesty uh one last question um what have you heard from small businesses um, who you're marketing to tourists um, and visitors about their ability to uh, find a place that they can actually maintain their business? I mean, you talked about the people's market as an example of a lot of very, very small businesses that really don't have a place, right? Because uh, they can't afford to actually open up a shop and operate it. What are, what are you hearing from those small businesses that we're highlighting as these are the jewels of Portland? Are they going to be jewels long? Well, I think part of the reason for My People's Market is to help them scale to the next level so that they do have the revenue to, to afford a permanent home. Some of those businesses had, and Prosper Portland really takes that role directly with the business and helping them find that place. Our job, our piece of that job is to help find them the business to business connections and, and find new markets where they can grow their revenue so that they can afford a, a space. That's why the partnership is so important because we have our lane. I appreciate the partnership and you're right, a lot of this is very interconnected, right? If you can't make sales, you can't stay in business, right. but if you can't afford your, your rent, uh, uh, Mr. Martinez is downtown, right? And I, I know that uh, is a lot different today than it was, say, in 2008 when you opened? Yes, <laughs> definitely. Right? Yeah, it definitely increases. Uh, rent has increased for us, so uh, we had to... But I feel like uh, there was a point in which we there was not even possible for us to open a retail, retail store. So thanks to tourism and thanks to, uh, like, Portlanders really loving our brand really has helped, has helped us a lot, yeah. I just hope we keep that conversation going because people can be in business if they can't afford to actually open up their storefront. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion. I'll accept the report as presented. Second. We have a motion from Commissioner Hardesty, a second from Commissioner Daly. Any further discussion? Carla, please call the roll. Fish. Thank you both for an excellent report. And um, um, I'm delighted uh, particularly to see the data on people recommending to friends and family that they consider coming to Portland. 
it, it, it does seem that, that every time someone has a unfortunate experience here, we get at City Council, we tend to get those emails. So it's nice to see a more balanced presentation on, and that people who visit the city share in the same pride that those of us who live in the city have in, in Portland. So thank you for your good work. Aye. Hardesty? Aye. You daily. Uh, well, thanks for the presentation and thanks for the reality check on uh, how the rest of the world perceives Portland. It's easy to get caught up in the social media echo chamber, um, but I know it's true that the challenges that we're facing in Portland are challenges that cities across the country and actually around the world are facing, so that is helpful. I look forward to working with you on the in the areas that I mentioned, and I vote aye. Fritz. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for all your, your work. I've been uh, on the Visitor Development Fund board for um, over 10 years now, and I, I really appreciate how well Travel Portland is run, and that's very much due to you, Jeff. So thank you for you and thank your you. team doing an amazing job. Um, many of you know that I was a registered nurse before I got on the council, and I worked evening shift for 27 years. So um, the Travel Portland's um, Development Fund Board is the only 8 o'clock meeting that I um, agree to attend on a regular basis and certainly the only one that I enjoy. Um, and I would like to look at the rate. There's hundreds of conventions that come to, to Portland. And the board looks at can we give grants to make the... Um, to make it possible for these con conventions to come, and then we get the room taxes so that we, do we then have more money that comes to various sources. It's always um, amazing to me just what a range of different professions, A, have conventions, and B, bring them to Portland. And so when we think of our entire, it's not only the economic impact of the taxes, it's also bringing all of these brain power, these talents, these varied things of people who come to Portland and say, wow, this is really nice. I mean, it's partly due to why we have so many people coming to live here is that they visit and then they stay. And I, I just, I think it's a very good thing. We do need to have a community discussion about how do we get more than the room taxes since we don't have a sales tax, uh, which can be a, a selling point to people coming to Portland. Um, but how else can these visitors contribute to our um, our entire community and, and pay uh, and perhaps a little more in other ways, not, not adding to the, the, the room tax, but yeah. in different ways. So again, uh, thank you very much. Aye. Wheeler. Excellent report. I appreciate it, Martin. Thank you for being here, thank Jeff. You thank you as always thank for you. your exceptional leadership. I vote aye. The report's thank adopted. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Next item, please, will be item number 280 report on recent work from the city auditor, data loss prevention, restoration projects, and green streets, cleanups of homeless camps, and the annual, annual following up reporting. Welcome, Madam Auditor Caballero. Thank you for being here. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, I am City Auditor Mary Hall Caballero. I am back with some members of my staff to share results of our latest audits. Um, the types of audits we conduct are comprehensive assessments of city programs or operations against performance criteria. The criteria may include sources such as city charter and code, national standards, professional standards, or a bureau strategic plan. The audit process has three phases. The planning phase involves identifying the appropriate criteria and meeting with management and staff to understand their work and any barriers that may keep them from achieving their goals or performing optimally. By the end of the planning phase, we've established the scope of our audit and meet with management to discuss it before we begin field work, which is the second phase of an audit. Field work is guided by a handful of objectives designed to assess whether the program or operation is meeting expectations of the criteria. If there are gaps between the criteria and the actual performance, we identify them as findings. Findings become the substance of our report and the basis from which we make recommendations for improvement. We have three performance audits to present today. The first assess whether the city is aligned with national standards to prevent data loss. The second focused on two Bureau of Environmental Services programs to manage restoration projects and build what are known as green streets. This audit is an example where better criteria in this case, completed environmental plans would help management deploy resources to highest need projects and evaluate program effectiveness. 
The third audit looked at the program the city created in the Office of Management and Finance to address some of the side effects of people living in tents and makeshift shelters on city property. The program began as a temporary response to people living outside, but has evolved into a multifaceted program spending $3.6 million annually. Before we begin, Mayor, I'd like to remind you that no council action at the end of our presentation today is necessary. We are here strictly for information sharing purposes. And so we will begin with the data loss prevention audit. Would you like to mention the follow-up process, or would you like yes, to review I that? Yes, I forgot to mention the follow-up. We have started this year um, publishing um, work that we've always done but haven't published, which is we always go back after an audit and check on the progress that a bureau is making. And we started to publish the results of those things, and we have one out currently on the uh, uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, and then we have one also on the um, Private for Hire Transportation, the Uber Lyft um, program. Where can people find those? You can find them on our website. You can also find them in our office. And I think it's easier said than done finding them on the website. Uh, I'll just come up to the office, okay. but maybe for everyone else. We're happy to bring them by, and I think okay. there's one in your packet as well. Thank you. And maybe the website for the listening public. Did you just say it? It is <laughs> portlandoregon.gov backslash audit services. Commissioners, I'm Kari Guy, I'm the Audit Services Director, and I'll describe our first and shortest audit. Um, in October 2018, we assessed the Bureau of Technology Services' overall approach to data loss prevention, and we also looked more specifically at the Bureau of Human Resources' um, data loss prevention practices. Data loss prevention is the practice of detecting and preventing unauthorized access to sensitive or confidential information. It can be deliberate or inadvertent, it can occur physically or electronically. For this audit, we contracted with an IT data security specialist. They conducted a number of tests around the city's systems, including um, reviewing the overall policies, procedures, roles, and responsibilities for data security in the city. They conducted after-hours desk reviews to look for unsecured laptops or exposed hard copy data in various Bureau of Human Resources offices. They reviewed access controls and lockout settings for our computers, electronic systems, and they observed BTS, um, Bureau of Technology Services, tests that were designed to prevent or detect data loss, among many other tests. The audit found that overall, the city's approach to data loss prevention was sound. The city is moving toward implementation of the National Institute of Standards and Technology Cybersecurity Framework, and that's a national best practice. However, the area audit also found some areas of vulnerability, and in a separate confidential report, we made 27 recommendations to strengthen the city's data um, security systems. The bureau managers committed to implementing those recommendations, and we will follow up in one year to make sure that's done. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Pape, and I'm a performance auditor, and I led our December 2018 audit of environmental services restoration projects in Green Streets. This is the second in a series of two BES stormwater management audits. We released an audit on private stormwater management in July of 2018, and we'll be following up on those recommendations this summer. Portland residents rely on restoration projects in Green Streets to improve water quality, restore wildlife habitat, and prevent flooding. But without formal methods to select projects and document outcomes, the city may not meet those goals. In 2018, the Bureau spent nearly $13 million in construction and maintenance for projects to treat rainwater runoff, including restoration projects in Green Streets. However, there was no formal method to track and report progress towards goals. Instead, the Bureau relied on piecemeal reporting and staff assurances. The Bureau uses restoration projects to meet watershed health objectives, such as improving water quality and habitat. Restoration projects include planting native vegetation and land excavation to create wetlands. Projects can vary widely in size, cost, and complexity. We looked at three projects based on input from staff, Albert Kelly Park, Luther Road, and Mason Flats. Green streets um, are recess planning strips extended from roadside curbs. The Bureau uses green streets to treat and slow water runoff 
the channels are planted with vegetation to filter pollution and slow and absorb stormwater. There are more than 2,000 green streets in Portland. We had three findings related to restoration projects in green streets. Our first finding was that restoration projects in green streets may not have addressed the area's highest needs. Despite intentions going back almost a decade, the Bureau did not have a stormwater system plan in place to guide the investment of capital spending for restoration projects in green streets. Existing plans were not enough. The Portland Watershed Management Plan, the systems plan for the combined sewer system, and watershed level plans did not meet the necessary criteria. Only a stormwater system plan will assist the Bureau with defining the areas of the city that are at the greatest risk for threats such as pollution, habitat loss, and local flooding. Our second finding was that it wasn't clear that restoration projects meant environmental and water management goals. The Bureau cannot demonstrate that its restoration investments were making overall progress towards watershed goals because of inconsistent and piecemeal reporting. The Bureau has affirmed the need for reporting restoration project outcomes, noting that reporting could provide benefits such as the ability to connect restoration project outcomes to watershed goals. The Bureau can't report on overall progress because there's no inventory of restoration projects on which to base reporting. None of the projects we reviewed had quantifiable goals and there are no pro protocols for consistent monitoring or data collection. Our final finding was that there was no reporting on Green Street condition to ratepayers or regulators. The Bureau cannot demonstrate to rate regulators or ratepayers that the million dollars it spends annually on Green Street maintenance kept them in functioning condition. A majority of Green Streets, 53%, were not inspected as required in the spring of 2018. The Bureau did not have a method to summarize eight separate condition scores for reporting or monitoring to ensure that staff met inspection and maintenance standards. The Bureau did not report on whether Green Streets were in functioning condition as required. Instead, it reported the total count of inspections and maintenance activities. In 2017, approximately 40% of Green Streets were not maintained at least three times, which was the standard, and 70 were not maintained at all. <laughs> no. I am stuck. I'm on 10. No, 11. Okay. <laughs> so, um, for our recommendations, to ensure that projects are cited in the highest priority areas, we um, recommended that the Bureau should commit to an implementation schedule for components of the stormwater system plan and create a method to use the risks identified to evaluate capital projects. To demonstrate that restoration projects met goals, we recommended that the Bureau develop an inventory of restoration projects and track information such as cost, location, project goals, and outcomes. Ensure that all projects had quantifiable goals that were tied to the goals of the Portland Watershed Management Plan or that reduced risks identified in the stormwater system plan. Regularly report project results to ratepayers in a way that explains the connections between projects and outcomes. Number five was the one recommendation the Bureau didn't really commit to. They said that they were working towards connecting individual restoration projects to the quantifiable metrics in the watershed report cards, but the report cards are only issued every four years, which may be too long an interval for, noting adapt for adaptive management or noting trends. Um, to provide reports about Green Street To demonstrate that restoration projects successfully met goals, we recommend, I'm, I'm on sorry, to Green I'm yeah. getting very confused. It's okay, we're, 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 not as, we're not as scary as you may think we are. We're auditors, so. <laughs> to provide reports about Green Street condition, we recommend that the Bureau define quantifiable standards to describe functioning condition for Green Streets, update operation and maintenance guidelines that support functioning condition and create oversight pr procedures to ensure that staff follow operation and maintenance guidelines. I meant to stress that the Bureau assisted us with coming up with recommendations and they were really helpful in creating um, concrete 
um, recommendations that they are going to follow up on. Um, we'll follow up with staff in December and let you know how they're doing implementing these recommendations. Good morning, my name is Christine Adams Wanberg. I'm a performance auditor and I led our March 2019 audit of the city's camp cleanup program. The Homeless Urban Camping Impact Reduction Program was created in 2015 and it takes complaints about camps, assesses site conditions, and removes trash in camps on city property. It removed 2.6 million pounds of garbage in fiscal year 2018. It's a fairly new program for the city, and we wanted to see how well it was performing, such as looking at the site assessments and cleaning, if it was meeting legal requirements for notice, if the crews were respectful, and how the program was responding to complaints. We found that overall the program was doing, program was doing well by improving the conditions in the camps. We did find that there were some improvements in communication to folks as well as program data. For people making a report about at the camp, they liked the ease of reporting a camp, but they did want status updates about what was, recurring with their, what was occurring with their complaint. We were pleased to find that the city was meeting legal requirements for posting notice, and we saw firsthand that crews were being respectful with those experiencing homelessness. These crews are hired through a contract with the city, and many of the crew members themselves are formerly homeless individuals. People living in the camps wanted better information on when the cleanups would occur. So rather than a seven or 10 day window, they wanted more information about when exactly they would have to move. Assessment criteria need to be better developed and applied. Currently, some of the criteria overlap and are not clear to the crews or the supervisors giving scores to the sites. Program data needs to be improved. It relies on several manual processes and separate systems. Currently, the program is not monitoring timeliness. The program is, however, working on some options for better systems. Program storage policies need to be more detailed on what is to be stored and how, and the facilities themselves needed to be upgraded. However, I would like to note that the program does have a new facility at this point where it is consolidated to the property. We recommend that improving communication data and internal policies by doing the following. One, improving communication to people in the camps about when crews will likely be there and then also improving the durability of the notices that are put up. Two, ensure contractors have a common understanding of what is personal property. Three, improve storage uh, policies and procedures. Four, give complainants status updates. Five, improve data quality and reduce manual processes. Six, use data to analyze and improve effectiveness, efficiency, and timeliness of the cleanups. And finally, seven, to clarify the assessment risk factors of scoring and ensure a common understanding of the crews about the criteria and identify what needs to be photographed. Uh, with that, I will turn it back over to Mary. So we're prepared for any questions that you have. Commissioner Hardesty. Thank you, Mayor, um, and thank you all. Uh, one of my favorite um, occupations are people who do audits because they're like just the numbers people, right? <laughs> Don't blame me. This is just what I found. Um, I have a couple of questions. First, about the uh, restoration project in the Green Streets. Um, I think I thank you for your audit. I think you did a really good job about really laying out the uh, what our vision is as compared to what our outcomes are. Um, and you said that number five was the only recommendation that was not agreed to. And uh, so I guess my question is for the fifth recommendation, um, A, why was it not agreed to? And B, what's a, what's a, what's a good outcome? Because four years does seem a long time. One year seems too often. Mm -hmm. How do we get to a place where the public gets the information they need? I think that's a discussion that um, you should have with the Bureau. Um, we mentioned in our report that the, the four-year interval seemed too long. On the other hand, a lot of these are really complicated projects that have very small incremental improvements. And so I think you're absolutely correct um, that you know, where, that, where that interval lies, um, where there's resources that can be devoted to it, and also where it really makes sense um, is something um, we're not taking a stance on. But I, I did, we, when we were performing the audit, um, we looked at the report cards. Um, we're doing our field work in the summer of 2018. Um, the index started, oh, I can't remember the exact date, but it was either 2011 or 2012. I think I might be wrong on that, but there was only one um, reporting period within the, I think it had been um, almost eight years that 
that the program had been in place. So we just didn't find that it was a, a tool that was useful for us for tracking trends or looking at whether or not projects were um, effective in meeting their goals. Thank you very much. I also appreciate the uh, two-page updates because that's helpful. I uh, One of the things that used to make me crazy was that we'd get an audit and then we'd hear nothing else about it until the next audit happened. And so this is really a good way for, at least I'll speak for me personally, to be able to track the work that's being done and to find out if we really are improving our governance in the process. So thank you for that. Uh, my last question has to do with the reports around the cleanup of the house, the homeless camps. Um, I know that this is a, uh, the cleanups are a complaint driven system, but they, and do you take complaints from both, both directions or is this just people that want people that they're uncomfortable with moved? So I'm, you know what I'm saying? So, it, I'm, so I'm trying to understand if I'm houseless and uh, my ID's gone, my medicine's gone, if I call and complain, am I gonna get help if I go through this process? Uh, Commissioner, um, so they take complaints from, from anybody. So it could be somebody who um, lives in a neighborhood and somebody is, um, there's a, a group of folks that are homelessness near the neighborhood, they want that place cleaned up. It could be somebody who potentially is living in a camp. Um, in many cases, when we went out and did field work, um, the folks who were actually living in the camp help with the cleanup. Um, and do we track that? I mean, I, do we track where the complaints are coming from? Um, Commissioner, we, we don't particularly track, like, um, is it coming from a particular address or neighborhood? Um, they tend to be um, uh, confidential. Um, huh. Hope I'm having that right. Confidential? So, so, so for example, anonymous? Um, some anonymous, except, exactly, I'm sorry. I, I had that wrong. Um, so they, they tend to be um, more of an anonymous feature in the database and everything like that. Some people do self-identify um, and say, hey, I'm from this, this is my address. They will give information on where that, that camp is. So here's the cross street, here's what I heard, here's the complaint and everything like that. Um, it could be somebody who just leaves their email address, however, so. And do we have a way of, uh, uh, how does the prioritization work? Uh, Commissioner, the way that it's supposed to work is basically a complaint comes in, um, staff in the program look at it, they will send it out to one of the contractors to do a site assessment. The site assessment will take certain criteria like where's the location, so for example, is it in a sensitive location, like is it near a school? Um, they will also look at other factors, um, for example, is there, um, are there needles present, um, are they blocking access, and they will make um, uh, basically a score based on that criteria, and that criteria will basically identify whether that site needs to be cleaned up and kind of the priority for that cleanup. My last question, well, actually my next to last question, uh, is um, uh, uh, I have heard a lot from community members who have lost ID in medicine um, and have had a really hard time getting those real necessary needs met. Mm -hmm. And so are there any recommendations about how we uh, protect people's vital, like ID information and medication uh, to make sure that it gets back to the right person in a timely manner? So Commissioner, one of the recommendations is actually to improve the um, policies and procedures for storing. Um, one of the things that we did find is that um, uh, some of that more sensitive information like, you know, if you had a, somebody with a credit card or a passport or something like that, medication, that that actually needs to be stored separately from the rest of the belongings and needs kind of a higher level of security for that. So that's what we're hoping is going to happen. And I think that the program was amenable to that. So Wonderful. Mm -hmm. And what is the training for people who are so subcontracted to go out and do this service uh, as far as the cleanups are concerned. Based on your, your report, it sounds like uh, there's not a standard across the board about what a priority site is, uh, what's appropriate, what the, uh, how much time the community needs in order to know uh, that, uh, that something is gonna be happening at that site. Uh, so, Commissioner, in terms of, uh, there are kind of two different things going on. One is the assessment criteria, which you have one contractor only kind of kind of doing that. And I think with cl more clarification of that criteria, it'll be very helpful. I think that will resolve, resolve a lot of issues. Um, in terms of um, 
the folks who are actually doing the bigger cleanups and everything, um, they do receive training. I would say that um, really when they get out in the field, when we did our field work and, and rode along with the crews and everything, um, sometimes it really is a judgment call on what is property, what is not. Um, and that's something that um, is difficult, but that the program um, gives updates to, um, and that's something that we're hoping that they can refine that um, information and, and continue to, to basically uh, work with those crews. Thank you, I mm -hmm. appreciate your work. Sure. Very good. Um, I'd like to just read a couple of comments, if I could. First of all, thank you, uh, Madam Auditor. Thank you to your team for three, what I think are very strong audits. So thank you for your detailed work. I, I particularly appreciate the fact that you may not have any knowledge about the Bureau or the program that you're going into, and you really take the time to get under the hood and uh, uh, meet with the employees who manage these programs. And the feedback I get has been uniformly very positive, so I want to thank you for that. There, there's an important symbiotic relationship here between the enterprises that we're individually responsible for and, uh, frankly, our limited bandwidth and inability to be accountable for everything that is going on in a $5.2 billion enterprise. So we really rely on you to help us be the eyes and ears in terms of the programs and help us sharpen our programs to make them more effective. So I, I want to acknowledge that and thank you for that. I want to speak specifically to the Homeless and Urban Camping Impact Reduction Program. This has obviously had a very rapid evolution just in the last several years. Uh, we have an Anderson Agreement, a legal agreement, which has been in place since 2014, and it was determined that the city needed to create a process where people living outside would be given notification and adequate time to remove their belongings, unless, of course, there were extending, extenuating public health or environmental circumstances. If belongings were not removed, the agreement was that the city would bag and tag and hold those belongings for 30 days. And you've made a couple of suggestions on how that process can be further refined. And I also want to acknowledge that the office moved the storage from a place that was really inconvenient to a place that is now centrally located and easier for people to gain access to. The coordinated campsite cleanup program started out in 2015 as a one FTE program in the mayor's office. And it's now grown over the years to include the one point of contact campsite reporting system, which you mentioned, as well as the homeless urban camping impact reduction program. The one point of contact program received 25,460 reports this year or excuse me, last year, uh, we're expecting to exceed that this year. So we have a three FTE program that had 25,000 plus reports last year. In 2015, they cleaned 139 camps. Last year, they cleaned 3,122 camps. The three team, the three person team takes in all of the complaints they have developed a prioritization risk assessment, which includes the, the factors that you indicated, environmental factors, public health factors, and other considerations. They have daily phone calls with outreach providers and emergency responders, and they also work to develop initiatives to address hygiene and trash issues that we see every day. And they attempt to establish partnerships with those in the camps to make that happen. Uh, just to give you some concept, uh, context on today, uh, in the last seven days, we've received 802 new campsite reports, identifying roughly 200 campsites throughout the city. So this is a widespread issue. When I came into office, the city was cleaning approximately 10 camps per week. We have increased the capacity, and now we're cleaning about 40 camps per work per week, and of course we've now also entered into an intergovernmental agreement with ODOT to be responsible for those right-of-ways because frankly we have the ability to uh, clean those camps uh, in a manner that we think is more appropriate for the city of Portland. The process looks something like this. All reports are read, they're reviewed by the city staff, and an assessment is conducted for all sites that have been reported so long as it's not a duplicate. Then Clean Start PDS is dispatched to perform the risk assessment that you mentioned. They pick up trash, 
and they also work with the people in the camp. They pass out trash bags, and often there is a collective effort to keep the campsite clean. Staff are looking for things like the amounts of trash, biohazard materials, needles, proximities to school, private residence, and uh, whether it's blocking sidewalk or blocking sidewalks or restricting access. Depending on the results of the predetermined assessment criteria, the sites are then evaluated. Staff then determine whether another level of intervention is necessary, and that intervention frequently includes engaging social service providers to put people in a place that is more, uh, that they're more likely to be able to get help than the location where they are already are. The program has had to walk the line between working with our outreach providers to uh, get folks the help they need to get off and stay off the street and holding the line when need, people need to move from public property when the situation has deteriorated. I want to be very clear on something. The goal of this program is not to solve homelessness. There are other programs that are supported and funded by the city to address the issue of homelessness. This program's goal is specifically to reduce the impacts of these camps by managing the waste and keeping the community safe and clean for the benefit of everyone in the community. We only started tracking last year, but last year we collected about 1,300 tons of garbage. This, uh, We've collected 1,139 tons just at the beginning uh, of this month so far this year. So we're collecting far more garbage this year than we did last year. I want to, again, thank the auditor. Uh, as you can see from the response letter, letter from the Office of Management and Finance where this program ultimately results, uh, resides, we're already beginning to work on a number of the recommendations that were put forth in the audit. Again, I thank you for those recommendations. And last but not least, and perhaps most importantly of all, I want to thank Lucas Pillier, who manages the program, and I want to thank coordinator Katie Lindsay and Jonathan Lewis for their continual and dedicated and thoughtful service uh, and their approach to this very, very challenging work. Uh, there is no question about it. You cannot make everybody happy when you are doing this work. And we've already seen something of the dynamic in this chamber this morning. There are some people who will say, we are not doing enough. And make no mistake about it, this program is not resourced to the scale of the problem in this community. On the other hand, there are those who say we are doing way too much and this is characterized as sweeping homeless camps. So you're never going to make everybody happy, but the work that you do is important. You get all the cl complaints. You are rarely thanked for the work that you do, and I want you to know as your mayor, I tremendously appreciate it, and I thank you for the work that you do. So thank you all for that. Thank you for the excellent presentation. Thank you. Perfect. We're right on time. Next time, certain item at 10.55. That looks like 55 to me, doesn't it? On the, the large two minutes to go. We'll take a two-minute break. That's a good <laughs>
right, we are now back in session. We're all well organized. I'd like to welcome back Auditor Mary Hull Caballero. Uh, for the record, I am I'm sorry, still... Mary. I should oh, read sorry. the title. Wait, can you, she needs to read the item. Sorry. 281, transfer payroll and non-payroll payment processing functions from the Auditor's Office to the Bureau of Human Resources and the Bureau of Revenue and Financial Services, respectively. Uh, for the record, I still am City Auditor Mary Hall Caballero, and I'm here today with a second consolidation proposal between the Auditor's Office and the Office of Management and Finance. A few weeks ago, you approved code changes to reflect the transfer of assessments, finance, and foreclosure from my office to the Revenue Division. That change reduced redundant steps in the city's assessments and foreclosure processes and allowed my former staff to benefit from exper expertise that resides in the Office of Management and Finance. I'm proposing today that the payment functions in the Council Clerk Division in my office be transferred to the Bureau of Revenue, the Bureaus of Revenue and Financial Services and Human Resources. Directors Jennifer Cooperman and Cyrilda Summers McGee have agreed to assume the auditor's payment responsibilities. You may not even be aware that the council clerk staff plays a role in vendor payments and city payroll. That responsibility harkens back to a time when the auditor's office was responsible for monitoring financial transactions and serving as a payment control. As the, as the accounting division and human services became more specialized and some controls have been built into the financial software, the auditor's role in vendor payments and payroll has become redundant. Carl is handing out a, a handout that shows the process um, and um, it's a graphic that shows the back and forth between the auditor's office and the accounting division to produce vendor payments. And by removing the auditor's office from that middle section, um, and before the checks go out the door, um, it, streamlines the, it streamlines the process and makes it a lot more efficient. I have delegated the auditor's charter obligations for vendor payments to the Bureau of Revenue and Financial Services, and I plan to do the same for payroll. Today's council action will amend the code to reflect the transfer. I'd like to thank Directors Cooperman and Summers McGee for working out the details of this consolidation as well as controller Michelle Kirby, payroll manager Tom Schneider, and Tony Anderson, who supervised the council clerk contracts division in my office. I'm also grateful to general counsel Jennifer Amiot for managing the code revisions, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Commissioner Fritz. Thank you for your presentation. Um, what's the um, financial implication of this? Uh, is money being transferred to um, provide this? Uh, so that the new staff, the staff in the new place are going to be able to do the same things that your staff have been doing? No. The work that is done um, in the council clerk's office is redundant to work that's already going on in both payroll and the accounting division. And so that second step, we're stopping that step. And the work that we're transferring over to the Office of Management and Finance does not uh, amount to like even a half-time FTE or something like that. It's, okay. it's a so in, in the financial impact statement, it says that um, check printers, uh, check stock related equipment <laughs> supplies are being transferred over. Is there a budget for those within your office that needs to be transferred over? You know, we have we ha we have the physical printers that the checks are are printed on, and then there's a an arrangement between the accounting division and human resources. Um, because the budget item for buying checks and toner and things like that for the printers is, it a, is in the accounting division. And so they will work out how payroll will get access to those So that items. internal materials and services is already not in your budget. Right. Thank you. Very good. Any further questions? Not at the moment. Very good. Is there any public testimony on this item, Carla? No one signed up. All right, that's fine. Uh, this is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your, your being here to describe that to us. We will move on to the regular agenda item 288, please. Amend ordinance to modify a condition of approval for the vacation of a portion of Southeast Claiborne Street east of Southeast 122nd Avenue, subject to certain conditions and reservations. Commissioner Udaley. 
Thank you, Mayor. PBOT has been working with Portland Parks and Recreation to vacate a portion of Southeast Claiborne Street located east of Southeast 122nd Avenue. This vacation will consolidate property owned by PPNR for the expansion of Leach Botanical Garden per its recently adopted master plan. Staff from both PBOT and PPNR, um, Lance Lindell and Brett Horner, will quickly walk us through the item and, of course, are available to answer any questions. Commissioner Fish, would you like to comment on this item? Uh, just Thank you, colleague. Just to say that I'm happy to see that we are achieving <coughs> another milestone in the Leach Botanical Garden project. We want to thank on behalf of Parks, we want to thank PBOT staff for their partnership in this important project. Gentlemen. Thank you for the great introduction. My name is Lance Lindahl, Portland Bureau of Transportation Right-of-Way Acquisition. And again with me today is Brett Horner from Portland Parks and Recreation. We're here today with a request to amend the previously approved ordinance that vacates a portion of Southeast Claiborne Street east of Southeast 122nd Avenue. This street vacation has been a cooperative effort between PBOT and Parks, and the end result will be a big positive for both bureaus. Uh, in this slide, you can see in the first photo, it shows Southeast Claiborne Street where it intersects with Southeast 122nd. The street's currently unimproved with a gravel surface, and this segment of street will actually be retained, widened, paved, and will have a sidewalk added as a part of the Leach Botanical Bar Gardens expansion project that's getting ready to kick off. Um, the second photo shows the portion of Southeast Claiborne Street that will be vacated. It's also unpaved and unimproved, and current plans call for this area to be uh, changed and constructed with a paved private driveway, landscaping, a new gift shop, and administrative offices, again, serving the garden exclusively. Here's a quick slide showing the Leach Botanical Gardens uh, master plan. Um, right in the center there, you can see the area that is being vacated as public right-of-way. It's outlined in the red box. So past actions that have um, occurred on this item, back on May 9th of last year, City Council approved Ordinance 188928, which vacated a portion of Southeast Claiborne Street subject to certain conditions. And then in January of this year, the Bureau of Development Services revised their response to the street vacation. BDS determined that the original condition of approval uh, was no longer needed. Um, at that time, there was split zoning that uh, was in place at this site that has been resolved through the comprehensive plan update that recently went through. And also there was a concern about um, doing a lot consolidation so that the historically platted lot lines would be extinguished. And um, upon closer review, BDS determined that that section of city code does not apply to lot zoned open space. So um, what happened is Parks was then being asked to do or to meet a requirement that was quite onerous in terms of survey work and application materials that was not really needed. So uh, in conclusion today, amending this ordinance will remove the now unnecessary requirement for the lot consolidation process. All other conditions of approval for this vacation have been met. So with this amendment as an emergency item, I'll be able to move forward and record the ordinance at this time, and this will allow the construction of the Leach Botanical Gardens expansion to move forward. Great, any questions? Any public testimony on this item, Carla? No one signed up. All right, very good. This is an emergency item. Please call the roll. Fish? Yet another example of PBOT and Parks working effectively together. Thank you, gentlemen, for your presentation. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Daly. Aye. Hardesty? Aye. You, Daly? Um, thanks for the presentation. I can't wait for the garden to be complete. Aye. Wheeler? Love to uh, see. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Order. Fritz. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> this is really a, a wonderful project, and it's um, a joy to see it continuing to move forward under Commissioner Fish and to have been a part of helping to plan it. Thank you, Brett Horner, for all of your work on it, as well as yours in Peabody. Thank you. I. Wheeler. Well, since she voted that way, I think it's good that we let her vote. 
Uh, this is fantastic work, beautiful garden. I'm always happy to see it evolve. So I want to thank my colleagues and their bureaus for working collaboratively to make this happen. Thank you. I vote aye. The thank you. ordinance is adopted. Next item, please. Item number 289. Accept bid of Granite Construction, Inc. for the Southwest Capitol Highway, Southwest 36th Avenue to Southwest Texas Street Pavement Rehabilitation Project for $1,787,787. Good morning. Good morning. I'm uh, Lester Spitler, the Chief Procurement Officer. You have before you the procurement report recommending a contract to Granite Construction uh, in the amount of $1,787,787. City Council approved ordinance number 189317 on December 19th to allow procurement services to competitively solicit an invitation to bid for the project. The engineer's estimate for the project was $2,024,646. Procurement services issued the invitation to bid and received six responses on February 19th. The lowest responsive and responsible bidder was from Granite Construction. Their bid amount is 11.7% under the engineer's estimate. The city's subcontractor equity program applies to this project, which identifies an aspirational goal of 20% for disadvantaged, minority-owned, women-owned, emerging small businesses, and service-disabled veteran businesses in the subcontractor and supplier areas of the project. Granite Construction has proposed a goal of 20.52% for disadvantaged and minority-owned firms in the areas of handrail fabrication, permanent signage installation, oil and asphalt hauling, saw cutting, traffic control, and trucking services. There are six firms that have been identified to perform this work, and all six are certified as disadvantaged business enterprises and minority-owned business enterprises. Granite Construction is located in Vancouver. They are in full compliance with all of the city's contracting requirements. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. The project manager from PBOT is in attendance as well. Otherwise, I recommend that you approve this report. Thank you. Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much for your report. Uh, my question is uh, the uh, disadvantaged business enterprises, uh, do you have a breakdown of just who is included in that? And again, you know, my question is always who's benefiting from these contracts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the DBE is a distinct, the Disadvantaged Business Enterprise, a distinct certification that the state um, promotes. It's different from the minority-owned business enterprise certification. So all six of the firms that are going to be performing the 20.52% subcontractor work are certified as both DBE and minority-owned firms. And that's, um, that's as far as the breakdown as we can, as we can go. That's not going to be sufficient. So I, 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 for me, I just need to know, like, when DBE doesn't tell me anything about who's benefiting from the contract, so I'm really interested in what specific firms are benefiting, right? And kind of, so I, just for feature reference, I need to know, like, the details of that breakdown. So you want to know the makeup of the company ownership? I, I want to know whether they are identified as a disadvantaged business, which traditionally is a white owned company, right? They may be starting off, might be a white woman owned company, at least on paper. Uh, but what I want to see is the diversity of the contracts, right? Is yeah. this an African American firm, Latino firm, Native American firm? Is it a woman? You know, I, the, the, the uh, alphabet soup just doesn't give me enough information to be able to determine who benefits from public uh, 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 contracts. Okay, the prime contractor is not certified but the six certified subcontractors are all minority-owned businesses as well as disadvantaged business enterprises. So I don't know uh, the exact ownership of those six firms, but I know that they're all certified with the state as minority-owned business enterprises. I think I appreciate that. I just, in the future, if you would be kind enough to make sure that I got that information ahead of time so I would be able to see who benefits from public contracts. Sure. That is the question that I'm asking. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. All right, any further questions? Any public testimony on this item, Carla? This is a report. It's a report. I'm sorry. Report. Commissioner Second. Fish moves the report. Commissioner Frisch, Fitt, Fritz. Fritz. Sec <laughs> that's a new one. Wow, Say that's that a new one for me. Now. And I'm stone cold sober. Commissioner Fritz seconds the report. Please call the roll. Fish. Aye. Hardesty? 
I'm really looking forward to the day that I don't have to ask in this chamber who benefits from public contracts. Uh, it is a very simple question, and using the alphabet soup that we tend to use really doesn't give me factual information that I need. Um, what I hope is that uh, the diversity of our community benefits when public dollars are spent, and that's what I'm looking for. And I will continue to ask that question and expect people who are providing public contracts to have those answers for me. I vote no. You daily. Aye. Fritz. So the, the information that they're all minority certified contractors is in the council documents. So, and I'm not sure how much we can delve further into the ethnicity of the businesses. I'm, I'm not sure that's that we can do that. Um, so I appreciate that they are getting 20% minority owned businesses, uh, getting $366,791 uh, from this procurement. I'm also really grateful that this project is happening. It's a fix our street project, uh, thanks to Commissioner Novick, and they've seen the signs on Capitol Highway every day when I ride this 44 bus, that your dime at work. And so it's, I think, really important to know that there are projects going on all over the city because of the gas tax, and that that's a really important work. Aye. Wheeler. I vote aye. The report's accepted. Thank you for your great presentation. Don't go far. Item number 290. Amend city code to increase the chief procurement officer's contracting authority and to streamline the procurement and contracting process. Colleagues, in July of 2017, the City Council passed an ordinance increasing the city's procurement officer's contracting authority from $500,000 to $1 million for public contracts for goods and services and construction, and from $100,000 to $500,000 for professional service contracts. Last December, the City Council extended that increased contracting authority until March 31st. This ordinance would make the Chief Procurement Officer's increased contracting authority permanent and additionally raise the authority for professional service contracts to $1 million to conform with other categories. And we, of course, have Chief Procurement Officer Lester Spittler is here to present the ordinance and answer any questions. Thanks for being here again. Thank you, Mayor Wheeler. Good morning, City Council. As the mayor said, um, I, I'm sorry. Before uh, legal counsel, I'm sorry to inter interrupt, Lester. Uh, legal counsel had advised me that um, there was an inadvertently missing underlining and strike throughs on Exhibit B. So I've been asked to uh, attach the correct document through substitutes. So I'll read what legal counsel has provided. The Exhibit B that was filed with the ordinance is inadvertently missing the underlining and strike throughs showing the proposed code changes. So we need a motion to substitute Exhibit B so we have the correct document attached to the ordinance for the record. So moved. We have second. a motion uh, from Commissioner Hardesty, a second from Commissioner Udaley. Any questions about the substitute? Could we call the roll, please, on the I'll substitute? Just, okay, uh, Commissioner okay. Fritz, you bet. Well, I just wanted to specify that um, there was, I was confused by the substitute because um, there, was, there was underlining and strike through for section A. This new section B um, takes, adds some, um, some criteria. So it says, um, for amendments not exceeding 25% of the original contract amount, amendments exceeding 25% of the original contract amount, provided the amended contract amount does not exceed 1.25 million. The director of the bureau whose behalf the contract was issued concurs. The agreed price agreements, uh, if the yearly estimated cost of the city is 1.25 million or less, um, amendments where an ordinance approved by the city council grants additional authority to the chief procurement officer beyond those stated rules, and that's the material change. Yeah, correct. So uh, would you just explain a, a little bit about what, what difference does this make? Sure. So um, price agreements are a different type of contract than regular contracts. They allow for more of an on-call nature of the work, where there's typically a task order that's issued for a specific scope of work but the contract in and of itself is uh, more on call. 
So uh, previously, we had the price agreement authority in section 533, which is the goods and services authority. Uh, it applied to 568, but we're just being more explicit about including it in 568 with this revision. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Any further questions on the substitute? Please call the roll on the substitute. Fish? Aye. Hardesty? <clears throat> So if I understand this amendment correctly, rather than having authority for a million, uh, now uh, the procurement officer would have authority to sign a contract for up to a million uh, two fifty. If that is my understanding, I uh, would not support this amendment, and I vote no. That's. Um, can I respond? Was that the? The, in the intent was there's always been authority in our rules that allows me to increase a contract by 25% of the original value. So I can't award an initial or sign an initial contract up to 1,250,000. It would be up to a million. And then if the Bureau needed more capacity in the contract from a funding perspective, then we could amend it to add 25%. So in the cumulative total is 1,250, but the initial contract would not be able to exceed a million. So uh, these are on-call contracts that you would be able to negotiate and without the council's oversight. Is that correct? That's correct. And uh, because of on-call contract, has there ever been a time that you've actually gone into negotiations on a million-dollar contract uh, for a on-call personnel? Yeah, the, the bureaus use a lot of on-call architectural and engineering contracts. And as part of that process, we're not allowed to take price into consideration when we're selecting a contractor. So what happens is the city selects the highest qualified contractor, and then we enter into negotiations with that firm on their hourly rates. The hourly rates are what they bill on each task order. So when a scope of work comes up under a price agreement, the Bureau engages the consulting firm. Um, they send them a scope of work. The consulting firm sends back a proposal and the proposed cost is reflective of the hourly rates that were negotiated uh, at the time the contract was awarded. So this is a RFP process? It's a qualifications-based uh, selection RFP process. And uh, it is a diverse pool of candidates that you're choosing from? Uh, the, same, the same goals and objectives apply to these types of procurements that apply to all of our procurements. So depending on the dollar value, we have to solicit them openly and competitively. If they're under a certain dollar value, um, if it's $100,000 and under, for example, the city is allowed to directly award a contract to a certified firm without going through any competitive process, which is a new pilot, and that's been wildly successful throughout the city. So how does the city determine whether or not it's effective in reaching its goals of contracting with communities of color, and very specifically across the board with women, how do we ever figure out whether or not those goals are achieved? So the city has an aspirational goal via our subcontractor equity program, and we report on those metrics every year on what the city achieves. I think recently you heard a fixing our streets presentation where the utilization was uh, in the 60%. So you know certain contracts are more, uh, are better suited for competing on a smaller level. So Lester, could I suggest this? Let's, let's finish the vote. It makes okay. me nervous that we, that we have I an ongoing dialogue in the middle of a vote. So let's sure. finish the vote and then let's have this conversation because it's a good one and I want to have it, but I just don't think it's appropriate to have it in the middle of, of an open vote. Aye. Continue to call the roll, please. You daily. Aye. Fritz. So did, you, you voted. I did and I, I voted no. Um, I'll vote aye to put it on the table. Wheeler. Aye. The amendment's on the table. Mayor, given that first. this is an emergency ordinance, obviously Commissioner Hardesty has um, some uh, questions. I had not reviewed this language and neither has my financial and legal genius in my office. So I'm wondering if we could set this over till next week so that we have, that Commissioner Hardesty has time to get a full briefing and that I have just a bit more time to look it over. I'd be willing to do that, yes. Would that be, I mean, uh, presumably it's an emergency because you need to get it done quickly. Is there a reason I'd, I'd, ra I'd rather hold it over for one week than remove the emergency clause if those are my options. I think those might be your options. Is that what you would request? I think that's a good idea. Okay, very good. 
So we will hold this over in my office. We'll bring it back next week. Thank you, Lester. I appreciate it. Next item, 291. Adopt revised comprehensive financial management policies, financial planning, operations and maintenance, and budget to address the city's financial planning and annual budget processes. Colleagues, this resolution adopts two revised comprehensive financial management policies and a related procedure that addresses the city's financial planning process and annual budget process. This item was originally heard on March 13th and this is a substitute resolution. CFO, Chief Financial Officer Jennifer Cooperman is here to explain the changes in the substitute resolution and answer qu any questions that we might have about the policies. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, as introduced, I'm Jennifer Cooperman. I'm joined by Josh Harwood, City Economist out of the City Budget Office. Uh, we're here today to present updates to two of the comp city's comprehensive financial management policies that address the city's financial planning and annual budget process. As the mayor stated, these are substitutes to what I presented on March 13th. There's one change from March 13th, and that's the deletion of language that addressed the funding of labor agreement costs. Um, and I'd like to take just a couple of minutes to highlight the following revisions that are being proposed to these policies. Uh, FIN 203, which discusses financial planning, has been revised to incorporate specific council direction for bureaus to prioritize asset management as a citywide core business function, including life cycle costing and the setting aside of replacement reserves. And asset management is defined to include the city's investments in capital assets and equipment. And assets are tangible assets as well as intangible assets. Intangible meaning software, right of way, et cetera. Uh, FIN 203 also um, is amended to direct bureaus to develop long-term financial plans, which are in addition to and go beyond the currently required five-year plans. Uh, they're intended to highlight the, and quantify in these financial plans and in the capital improvement plans funding gaps as well as proposing strategies to address them. Uh, as submitted, FIN 203 will codify the current restriction of capital set-aside resources to projects relating to emergency preparedness, parks and recreation, and transportation. Per resolution 371 37101 from 2015, these restrictions are otherwise due to expire on June 30th, 2019. FIN 204 budget has been revised to require bureaus to secure council approval for financial commitments, such as bureau director decisions or litigation settlements of half a million dollars or more after the current year budget is approved that a bureau otherwise cannot accommodate change guidance for amending the budget during the year to urgent and unforeseen needs rather than needs that are just unanticipated, <coughs> will allow one-time resources to be used to address citywide liabilities that are not included in the city's five-year forecast, will consolidate the capital set-aside ranking and funding process to once per year during the annual budget process, and will set certain limitations on the competitive special appropriations grant process and we're available to answer any questions that you might have about these financial policies. Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you, Mayor, uh, and thank you so much, uh, um, Director Cooperman. My question has to do with the uh, funding limitations uh, on FIN 2.03. If you look under the funding, uh, we have very narrowly uh, um, set a standard for how that 50% could be used. That includes emergency preparedness, parks and recreation, and transportation. Does that mean that if any other bureau in the city has a, uh, a desire to actually uh, utilize that money that's been set aside, that they would have no access to it? Can I speak to that? <laughs> uh, I can try. Yeah. Um, uh, for the record, uh, Josh Harwood, City Economist. Uh, our director, Jennifer, uh, uh, Jessica Kennard, could not be here today. She is um, experiencing the wonders of flu season, so um, <laughs> apologize for her not being here. Um, the, the short answer is yes. However, it is within council's capacity to waive the policy in, in an individual circumstance and state why they're doing it. 
Um, and so, Actually, could I just dive yeah. in here? Because I was, the current policy is this. It was due to a binding city policy that the council adopted uh, a little over three years ago to, because we got the um, overall asset, asset report and looked at where are the biggest deficits and they're in those three bureaus. So that's where the 50% set aside is currently set aside to be. That was due to sunset in four years, which is why we're having this conversation on that. So thank you for raising it. It doesn't preclude um, the other 50% of the one-time money going to asset management as well. So that's where we're trying to be really focused on where do we get the biggest bang for the buck in, in which bureaus, and knowing that there's still the other, in this year's budget, there's 14 million in the one-time, 7 million to asset management in these three areas, and 7 million that could go to something else. And I would also say that um, it's been a little bit, the, the term emergency management has been used a bit creatively in, the, in <laughs> recent times in that it funded, um, I think, the police, I mean, the firefighters' um, apparatus. apparatus, right? Well, thank you very much. That's very helpful because, oh, I think I just turned me off. Um, so uh, what is the definition of emergency preparedness? Because as you know, I have the rest of the first responders in my portfolio. So I'm so really that surprised that you're <laughs> questioning this particular thing. <laughs> well, I'm not, you know, if it says emergency preparedness, I'm, I'm just wondering if it's across the board. As you said, it's been used creatively that way. I guess my concern is that we don't know what we don't know yet. And there may be something else that comes up that needs capital improvement. And I'm just concerned that we're... Uh, painting ourselves into a box that we will not be able to get out of. Could I, could I make a suggestion Please. here? Um, I would recommend we adopt this policy, but I do think there is a need for us to review the question of the categories. Uh, one could make a very strong case, and, and Commissioner Hardesty, I, I believe you've made, well, you, you haven't necessarily made this case, but you talk a lot about technology, mm -hmm. and technology is becoming more of infrastructure to the work we do. One could make a case that city technology should be included as part of the capital side. I'm not saying that, that that's where I am today, but I, I do think it would be useful for you to go off and for some period of time review that question about whether we have the right buckets, whether we should be considering different buckets, and then come back to this council with recommendation. And as a point of information, Matt, we did use that bucket for the data center that was transferred out of the earthquake in, in, area. In, indeed we did. Yes. Hey, I'll, I'll just put my cards on the table. I'm all for flexibility, but you know, the, the, the trade-off, of course, is more flexibility means less discipline. And mm -hmm. so we need to find that, mm -hmm. that right balance. So for, for certain folks who weren't here in 2015 when the prior resolution 37107 was adopted, that did a few things, but one of the most major ones, in my opinion, was it increased the capital set-aside percentage from 25% up to 50%. Mm -hmm. So the council did take a very proactive step recognizing the infrastructure needs. Um, in talking with city staff, um, I think there is a, a desire to, for you to have more flexibility than less, uh, and that identifying the buckets up front is restricting you because there are needs that do come up that might not easily fit into those three buckets. The choices and the allocations will come to you regardless. That's right. So. Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you, Mayor Wheeler. I this seems like an important piece. Um, and I would offer, if we could just hold this over so that we could have more of a conversation on it until next week. I, I'd rather not. I'd, I'd rather move forward on this. But you know, as, as, I, as I said, um, per, what we could do is we could establish in the legislative record a request that you come back in six months or whenever with a more thorough analysis on whether we have the right buckets. But I think it's important that we move forward on the fiscal policies. Mr. Mayor. Any other? Mr. Mayor. Oh, I'm sorry, Robert. Sorry. Uh, one, one formality. <laughs> Josh. Sorry. One formality. I, like, I believe there has been a substitute resolution. Yeah, that no, so be formally we'll, we'll get to that. I just, I didn't want to interrupt the flow of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Is there more on this particular subject before I ask if we can get a motion, please, for the substitute resolution? 
So moved. Second. We have a motion from Commissioner Fritz, a second from Commissioner Fish. Any further discussion on putting the substitute on the table? Please call the roll. Fish. Aye. Hardesty? No. You daily? Aye. Fritz? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. The substitute's on the table. All right, so we're open for more questions, thoughts, concerns. Any public testimony on the resolution? Uh, no one signed up. Very good. Call the roll. Fish. Uh, thank you um, uh, to Director Cooperman and all those who uh, worked on this, this uh, set of policies. And I appreciate the changes that were made from the last iteration to what we have before us today. Hi. Hardesty. Thank you so much, um, Director Cooperman. I really appreciate the work that you and your team have done on this project. Um, I cannot in good faith vote for something that um, I do not support the limitations that we are putting on ourselves. And it is not acceptable to me that I need to wait six months so that I can have clarity on whether or not we are moving in a direction that makes sense. I vote no. You daily? Um, I believe this is the third time we have considered this set, or, well, second, really only the second? Feels like the third time. Um, I appreciate the revisions, my concerns have been addressed, and I vote aye. Fritz. So if this resolution were to be rejected, um, the current policy is to direct 50% to parks transportation and emergency management and the reason for that is that the unfunded liability in the in especially in parks and transportation dwarfs all, all other needs in the city we added emergency uh, preparedness to allow some more flexibility while still focusing on the things that are the most urgent and the most cost effective and so um, this takes away the sunset um, and I appreciate all of the different policies and thank you for taking my feedback and incorporating much of it I Wheeler Thank you, CFO Cooperman, for your presentation. Josh, thank you. Uh, thanks for the hard work that you have put into this, your staff, OMF, along with the city budget office and city budget managers all across the city who work to develop these revised policies. Thank you again for your flexibility on taking into account our input in recent weeks to help solidify uh, our viewpoints. I look forward to continuing the conversation with my colleagues in the Office of Management and Finance about how we can best address the question of funding labor agreement costs, since one of the agreements we made collectively was to withdraw that from consideration today. The revisions to, your, to our comprehensive financial management policies, I believe, improve the city's financial planning, financial management, asset management, and providing adequate reserves, aligning our policies with national best practices, and encouraging responsible stewardship of city assets. These improved policies will help us to achieve our financial management goals, including better long-term planning, promoting collaboration during the annual budget process, directing resource towards critical infrastructure projects, addressing intergenerational equity issues, and maintaining financial sustainability. One final note I'll put on the table, these policies are always subject to change. This is fluid, they evolve as the needs and the interests of our city and our fiscal structure evolve. I appreciate the hard work you've put into it, it's an excellent product, I vote aye. The resolution is adopted. Next item please, 292. Appoint Annalise Kohler to the Portland Housing Bureau Bond Oversight Committee for a term to expire March 1, 2022. Excellent. We have uh, Portland Housing Bureau Director Shannon Callahan here this morning. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, we had expected um, Annalisa to be here this morning, but I think she um, is not quite here yet. So um, if you wouldn't mind, I'll just do a little brief introduction um, about um, Annalise uh, Kroeller, who is... Ah, Annalise. Hi. Oh, great timing. So have you ever had that nightmare where you walk into a crowded room and you're... Everyone's <laughs> staring at you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so uh, the Bond Oversight Committee is composed of five community members. Um, one of each is appointed by um, each of the commissioners and the mayor. Um, Commissioner Hardesty is appointing Annalisa this morning um, to replace um, Jess Larson, who was a previous appointee of uh, Commissioner Salzman. Um, Annalise has worked with the Housing Bureau 
um, for quite some time on affordable housing issues, as well as um, was on the committee that moved forward the original uh, ballot measure for um, the Portland housing bond itself, the Welcome Home uh, Steering Committee. Annalise is also a, a public policy advocate for the food bank, and we are privileged and honored um, to have her on our oversight committee. So with that, I would turn it over to Annalisa. Yeah, thank you. Um, I thought I'd have a couple of minutes to think about this, but <laughs> <laughs> coming, coming in hot. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm very excited about this um, and feel very privileged to be here. I started at the food bank about seven years ago, and my assumption was that I would be working on food stamps and other kind of anti-hunger policies and programs, and uh, very quickly, I have spent the bulk of my career there working on housing. Um, our public policy priorities are guided by what we hear from the people that we serve, and unsurprisingly, I'm sure to you, housing is the number one reason that people cite. So, worked on the uh, Portland housing bond and the Metro housing bond, and really excited to be able to see some of that work through on the oversight committee. Thank you. Very good. Well, first of all, let me say thank you. Number two, let me just say you do really well on the fly. <laughs> that, that, was, that was exceptional. Number three, um, uh, I want to thank Jess Larson for her service to this important committee, and I want to thank you, Annalise, for, for being willing to come on board. I know you're a busy person. Side note, uh, my wife Katrina was at the food bank last oh. night with, I think, 17 or 18 other volunteers yeah. from, from our daughter's school, and they, yeah. they had a blast. Yes. And they came back and just said, you know, the Oregon Food Bank is just a paragon of organization. And I just wanted to pass that on to you. Thank um, so thank you for, for your willingness to, to serve. With that, I'll accept a motion. So moved. Second. We have a motion to accept the report from Commissioner Hardesty, a second from Commissioner Udaley. Carla, please call the roll. Fish. Well, Annalisa, thank, thank you very much for stepping up and offering to serve. Um, and also thank you for the work you did on both housing bonds. Um, the Metro housing bond uh, was, I thought, a particularly collaborative and extraordinary undertaking, and I set aside almost a day a week last fall to participate uh, in the leadership of that effort, and I know you and the food bank made a huge difference, and we ended up winning in all three counties, mm -hmm. which is really... Uh, a testament to the strength of our coalition. Yeah. Um, thanks for all that you do for our community and thank you for stepping up again to serve in this important role. I'm pleased to support your nomination, aye. Hardesty. Um, I wanna also thank Jess Lawson for her service and her uh, visionary leadership um, on this committee and I'm really thrilled to um, have um, Annalise uh, come and uh, take that spot. Um, the Oregon Food Bank is uh, near and dear to my heart as someone who uh, loves the Waterfront Blues Festival. I have pretty much interviewed anybody and everybody who's ever played at the Blues Festival, and my favorite interview is always with the Oregon Food Bank uh, because it is real that the folks who work and volunteer are doing it not for the money, but doing it purely out of the love of community and the love of people. I vote aye. You daily? I'm going to um, add to the chorus of thanking Jess and welcoming Annalise. Um, I like to take every opportunity I can to highlight the fact that despite our booming economy, Oregon has one of the worst rates of food security in the country, and I'm really grateful to have someone serving who understands this intersection of housing unaffordability um, and hunger. And I vote aye. Fritz. Thank you, Ms. Cole, for, yeah. for being here and for explaining your work at the Food Bank and how it does relate to housing, as Commissioner Udaley said. And uh, I appreciate your service. You have big shoes to fill, but I'm sure you can do yes. it. Hi. <laughs> Wheeler. Very happy to support this appointment. Thank you, Commissioner Hardesty, for bringing it forward. I vote aye. The report's accepted, and the appointment is approved. Welcome aboard. Yay, now you get to volunteer lots of hours for free. Yes. <laughs> it's going to be great. Now she's running off to the next step. I say, who was that masked woman? <laughs> next item, please. 293. 
approve application under the multiple unit limited tax exemption program for Northeast Killingsworth Apartments located at 5470 Northeast 16th Avenue. Very good, we have uh, uh, Shannon Callahan, director of the Housing Bureau is here and Dory Van Bockel who uh, is responsible for our multi-program. I don't know who's presenting today, but I'll just introduce you both. Uh, good morning again, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, morning. Shannon Callahan. Uh, just as way of reminder, um, City Council passed a comprehensive inclusionary policy, housing policy in um, 2016. Prior to when that policy took effect, 19,000 units of housing were permitted and vested um, in the, that program beforehand, meaning they did not have to comply with the requirements to include affordable housing in their developments. Um, based on the large pipeline um, that did not supply any affordable housing, um, the mayor and commissioners asked us to look at creating a program to incent that pipeline to come forward and voluntarily include affordable housing. Um, after working with City Council and the Multnomah County Commission, a program was approved to provide a limited tax exemption for a period of 10 years in exchange for uh, 10 years of affordability. The, um, the development you have before you today is the first development to take advantage of that program. Um, it will be providing eight units um, uh, in their new development for affordable housing. The um, range of rent savings for tenants who would reside in that building um, would be from a $479 savings a month to $650 savings a month in the one bedrooms. Um, and with that, I would like to just turn it over to Dory to add a few comments, and we're here to answer any questions you might have. Good morning, Commissioners, Mayor Wheeler. I'm Dory Van Bockel, Program Manager of the Multi-Program. And as uh, Shannon mentioned, this project will bring eight units to um, the affordable housing portfolio. They will be affordable at 60% of median family income. That's 20% um, of each of the unit types. It's not a real big building. There's only 39 units, and they are comprised of studios and one bedrooms. So we'll have four studio apartments and four studio one bedrooms. Um, this is located in... Um, fairly high opportunity area within the city. So it'll be ground floor commercial space. There's lots of uh, restaurants and other commercial activity there along Killingsworth. And the um, developer has expressed interest in um, using the city's preference policy to help rent those units as well. Very good. Colleagues, any questions? Please call the roll. I think everybody signed oh, up. Oh, I'm sorry. Left. Is there anybody signed up? I apologize. I think they all may have left. It was Lightning, Maggie, Courtney, Shannon, and Desiree Rose. Please call the roll. Fish. Aye. Hardesty. Aye. You daily. Happy to see the incenting the pipeline working. Aye. Fritz. Very happy to see that they're choosing 60%, which is the greater need, and also that there's a mix between the smaller one and then one, one bedroom. So again, good work. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. Thank you. Mayor. The ordinance is adopted. Commissioner Fish. Uh, 283 was pulled light by lightning. He is not here right now. I would urge that we just read it and go to a vote. 283, please read it. Authorize the acceptance of a donation of 385 square feet of real property on Northeast 11th Avenue, adjacent to Woodlawn Park, to be used for park purposes. Carla, is there anyone signed up for public testimony? Uh, this was pulled. I didn't have a sign-up sheet. But Very good. Call the roll. Fish. Aye. Hardesty. Aye. You daily. Aye. Fritz. Commissioner Fish, I'm going to be highly entertained to see what your operations and maintenance budget request is going to be for this. It's going to be a big number. I uh, thought it might be. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. 284, please. Accept a grant in the amount of $1,682,468 from the Oregon Department of Transportation and authorize an intergovernmental agreement for the I-205 undercrossing project. Who pulled this Mr. item? Uh, Commissioner Ma Hardesty. Hi, Mayor. Um, I was the one that pulled this off the Very agenda. Good. I have all my questions answered. Um, I do apologize that you had to hang out. Oh, that's okay. Uh, but I feel very confident and positive, and this is a great thing for my community. Very good. 
thank you for being here and thanks for your hard work on this. Would you like to yeah. put your name in the record so people know oh, yes, you? Please, please, no, 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 um, here. For the record, Elizabeth Tilstrom, project manager with uh, the Portland Bureau of Transportation. Excellent. Thank you for your work. Thank, thank you, Elizabeth. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Please call the roll. Fish. Aye. Hardesty. Aye. You Daly. Aye. Fritz. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. We are adjourned.